Well, hello, fellow plot questers. It is I, Aaron the Plot Quester, and today I got this great book, The Serpent's Shadow by Rick Riordan himself. And well, let's get right on to it. So, fittingly, for the arrival of my new bookcase, I had to return to a classic, a Rick Riordan book. Now, the past couple weeks, I've just been reading, you know, Rick Riordan and Presents and other just fantasy novels that I find there and there. And then I return to Rick Riordan and I go, I need to reread this entire shelf again, don't I? Because, Jesus, the quality is just different. Like, you can tell what the difference is. So, Crane Chronicle, book one and book two right here. And the rest of my Rick Riordan collection. I don't have all the specials, but I've read them all, obviously. And let's get right on to it. So, today actually, I'm not going to talk much about the plot. Ironic, because my name is Plot Cluster. But I'm going to do an analysis as a sort of writer's perspective on how it's written, I guess. I don't know. And sort of go through it and basically explain to you why this book feels so ingenious to you. Of course, you can tell because it's really, really good. But I wanted to explain a little more specifically why it's so impactful. So, a uh, quick summary of the plot, Sadie and Carter Kane, Egyptian magic is real, Egyptian gods are real, Apostas is rising, and he's gonna, when it swallows the sun, the world ends. And preferably to not let that happen, they need to find the serpent's shadow, which is a part of its soul that can be used to basically kill it. And it's their quest. And that is basically it. Now, first of all, the opening sequence in Dallas Museum. Now, this opening sequence does a lot of things, really good things, at the same time. First off, we immediately know what's at stake. Once we read the first, first chapter and second chapter with this opening sequence, from number one, we know that if we fail, the world will end. Typical. And we also know what sort of powers these magicians have. We see them using Egyptians' hieroglyphics, and we see them wielding a kopash, or an Egyptian traditional sword. And basically, we know how strong the characters are. Even if you haven't read the first two books, we know how strong the characters are, what they can do, what the setting is, and we also can tell what's at stake and what the basic plot will be. And also, it has a little bit of air of mystery, like, oh, you have to look for what's not there, and a little bit of hints of what's to come. And of course, you can relate with the actual actual title, which is The Serpent's Shadow, so we can guess that it's about a serpent's shadow. So when we talk about the giant chaos snake, we probably think, oh, the, shadows, the shadow of this chaos snake probably related to the book. And we can sort of put one, two and two together. In other words, the opening sequence sets everything up, makes us excited, and shows a little bit of action to show the, what, show us what the characters can do. Excellent, perfect, immaculate. Next is the sort of after opening sequence, which is a lot of, it's a lot of setting up and tension building. So first of all, for example, there's the mysterious heirs. Walt is gonna die in a couple days, I mean, in literally basically a day, and the world's gonna end in two days. We <laughs> And <laughs> yes, the world's gonna end in two days. And the mysterious heirs, the way that Walt is saying, oh, I'll probably die by then, but I have a secret plan, blah, 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 blah. Plan A, plan B, for stopping chaos from swallowing the sun, and etc. And it's definitely, there's definitely the build up of plot with, you know, the enemies rising and we finding out that the rebels are actually working with freaking apostles and on and on. And there's a lot of set and there's a lot of build up, making tension rise like a sandwich. Maybe that wasn't the best analogy, but bear with me. And also, a lot of mysterious errors, and there's a setup for a little bit of romance. Because you see, when I was writing my book, for me, I felt that the romance scenes were the hardest to write. Because you can't make them just come out of nowhere. If it comes out of the blue, it feels like it's, a, it's apart from a different book plastered into your book. It doesn't feel natural, it doesn't feel like it flows, and a book definitely needs to flow if you want your readers reading. So the way that Rick Riordan basically bypasses this is he sets up a little bit of this romance, a little bit of this romantic tension, sexual tension, in the first half of the book. And basically we are expecting some sort of um, moves to happen between 
well, in this case, four characters, because they're Sadie Kane's relationship and Carter Kane's relationship, the two main characters. But it sets it all up, and that makes it so that we can sort of expect that. So later on, when the actual moves happen, they won't be completely out of the blue and surprise the heck out of all of us. Good? Definitely. Even if you haven't read the previous books, you will be able to get everything. From the romance, to the plot, to what's on stake and what these characters can do by the first half of the book and you probably won't even be that confused. In fact, if you're quick with the catch on, you'll have no problem reading through this one without reading these two. Ingenious? Definitely. Now I'm gonna skip right to the final battle because in the middle the plot, the quest, the pacing, all excellent, not really what I want to talk about. Of course, Rick Riordan's classic putting in mythology, Egyptian mythology, and making that relevant to the plot. Ingenious, but like I said, it's basically what he's known for, so I don't think I need to mention that too much. And final battle. So, we've all had, had that extreme pile-up of hype from like half of the opening sequence, like, we are gonna kill you, Carter and Sonny K. The Kings are working with the bosses. And meanwhile, they are actually working with the bosses, and they're going, Oh, we're gonna kill the House of Life, blah, 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 and we're gonna make a rebellion, and we'll march on you in three days, we're gonna kill you. Well, that definitely brings up the tension and the hype, and we've been waiting for this big bang for this entire book. And when it delivers, it does not disappoint. The big bang is a really big bang. The gods come down from the skies. Sadie and Carter finally release their full powers as the eyes of the gods. Ka ha ka ka um, Carter as the eye of Horus, the god of war, and Sadie as the eye of Isis, the, god the goddess of magic. And they rise and they are strong. And they have this really epic scene with Carter King going all in and banishing Apostles' the shadow. The entire final battle with like even the minor characters playing huge parts and everyone having cool moments with epicness and we've had all this tiring quests and stuff and it's all this build up and it's finally time to go so Rick Riordan did it perfectly once again all the hype all the epicness combined together like it's the ride of rural hero and lord of the rings that's a book also but you know, the, but the I feel like the movie made the epicness of the battles more specific, but that's another book, so let's go back to this. And it really, really made me feel the hype, the epicness, and when finally all of the battles are won, when Carter King stands as Paroa, the god king, the person who's ruling over the entire forces of Egypt. No, it can't get better than that, and him addressing the crowd, and him giving the orders, that was really epic, and I feel like Carter's a really a dork. He's not very confident, but making him, seeing him grow like that leader, and even after Horus has to leave, he uh, he retains that vibe and he retains that authority. So I feel like that's a lot of character development on his part, and I think that's really really cool. Of course, the lovable dork is still in there because well, you can't have a man change completely, you know. And the final prologue sort of thing, with basically all their romances working out. So, um, Carter getting together with Zia, and our dear Sadie going together with Anubis slash Walter. Don't ask, read. And basically, their romances work out, and finally all that sexual tension is resolved, and the romance at the end does not come out of nowhere because we've been waiting for that since the start of this book and if you have read the full trilogy since the start of this book but anyways like i said one of the greatest ways greatest the most ingenious thing about this book is that even if you read this book without reading the other ones you would still get the fulfilling feeling after reading this book because well rick riordan does the building tension building and romance tension building a uh, hype building all of that Within this book, in this arc, you don't really need to read these two if you want to read this. However, obviously, if you want to fully understand the story and get the full experience, you need to read these three books. And that is my analysis on Serpent's Shadow. So I talked about the opening sequence, 
the sort of setup and the sort of build up and the tension and the full release of the tension and the prologue of basically giving what these characters deserve and what we feel like they deserve after the, such an ordeal. So that is my, um, basically me fanboying over the Serpent's Shadow for however long this video is. And that is pretty much it. So thank you all for watching. And now I think I'm gonna go edit my book for two hours. That is very, very inspiring. And well, like always, your plot cluster and the plot cluster. Thank you guys all so much for watching. And if you haven't read any of Reguardon's books, you've been living under a rock, like as big as the sky for a very long time, kiddo. You need to go read right now. And I'm not kidding. This is an order, not a suggestion. And well, I hope you enjoyed and I hope you get a little bit more insight of what authors have to deal with when they're writing because like, I never considered it, and then I tried it, and I'm starting to consider it now. <laughs> yeah, excuse me. And like always, your podcast are the podcaster, and goodbye.